This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Very good. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 21st, 2021, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, uh, general law, uh, chapter 30A, section 20, and signed uh, Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsek and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, mute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougall? Present. Doug Marshall? Present. Janet McGowan? Here. Johanna Newman? Here. And uh, myself, of course. Um, board members, if you have technical issues, please let Pam know if there are technical issues. We may need to pause temporarily to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call you on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment item and other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Um, I just wanna note uh, in addition that the, the Bangs Center ramp project will be continued under old business. So uh, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. So please reserve any public comment on this project uh, to that portion of the meeting. Uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, additionally, we will not be taking public comment as part of the preview of the proposed zoning article 16 on a temporary building moratorium. Um, so uh, with that said, if you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and can be entered into a search engine by typing uh, as shown. And the link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand uh, button. When public comment is solicited, if you have joined the Zoom meeting, Using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. So residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discussion of the planning board chair, if a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So with that, we can get into our agenda and uh, we have no minutes, correct, Pam? That is correct. All right, mm -hmm. so um, I'm just bringing up the participants here. So, oops. Um, all right, so we have a, a public comment period and I do not see any any hands raised. Oh, Susanna. Hi, Susanna, can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Susanna Mosprat, 38 North Prospect Street. Um, I just want to say generally that I hope all the goals of the master plan are being pursued as you make decisions about Amherst Town Center, not only those related to housing densification. Let's not forget the arts and culture, historic preservation, encouraging small businesses, fostering community, and favoring climate-friendly materials and practices. 
I think that quality of life will have a bigger impact on the town's long-term success than tall buildings that pack in as many residents as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna. And um, I see no other hands raised. So let's proceed into uh, the public hearing. Let me bring up the preamble for that. Jack. Oh. Did you see that Ira Brick Ira, yeah. so raised Ira, his hand? Okay. Ira Brick, please. Hello, Ira. Hi, how are you? Very good. Good. But thank you. So. <clears throat> I just want to urge again that people just consider the highest and best use for downtown, not the tallest and best use, but really what we want for generations, considering all the changes that are happening to the world, to college populations, to uh, towns that have gone down the route that Amherst is going down and the results are sad. I encourage a moratorium not to hurt any business or any developer, but actually to just pause a minute so that they don't go down the wrong road. This is uh, the town that a lot of people want to live out the rest of their lives. And I know a lot of people that are very discouraged that living in Amherst, you know, if you live in a hill town, you say, I use Greenfield, I use Northampton. There's more and more people that live in Amherst that say, I use Hadley, I use Northampton. We need to pause and figure out what is the right balance in here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ira. All right, with that, um, oh, Chris, you have your hand raised. I just wanted to remind people that we're not taking public comment on the moratorium tonight. Um, the public hearing for the moratorium will be on um, May 19th. Tonight is just an opportunity for the board to become familiar with the zoning amendment. So I just wanted to remind everybody about that. Thank you. Very good. Um, again, let me get that preamble uh, together. And, oh, where'd it go? I'm sorry. Uh, just give me a minute. <laughs> Jack, you don't really I, need I, a pre preamble. You can just read the description from the agenda and say it's oh, a I, No, I, I have it. I have it. So, um, but I can do either. Um, so, um, we're, we're continuing the hearing for SBR 2021 06 North Amherst Library at 8 Montague Road. It's continued from uh, March 17th, 2021 and April 7th, 2021. Uh, and it's a request for the site plan review, approval to add an addition to the existing building and add new parking, walks, utilities, drainage and landscaping. Um, it's on map 5A, parcels 37 and eight. Um, it's the B-VC zoning district and any uh, board member disclosures since the last session. Um, and there are none. Um, and so who's gonna present from, uh, from the applicant? Chris Farley and- Chris uh, Farley, okay. I think, yep. Yeah. Do you wanna start off, Chris? Well, I, I uh, Mike sure. okay. I'd, I'd be happy to, Mike um, and Jack. Um, well, thanks so much for uh, uh, letting us uh, join you again uh, this evening. Um, so uh, between our last uh, hearing and tonight, we submitted uh, some modified uh, site plan drawings. Um, we submitted a modified lighting plan, photometric plan, uh, we submitted uh, written responses for the design review board suggestions, as well as the uh, DAAC suggestions. Um, we submitted a written response uh, to how we were tr proposing treating the uh, northern edge of the parking area. Um, 
and I guess I my question would be, would you like us to go through each of those, uh, uh, review each of those with you now? Or, or, or would it be, I, I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to review those. Um, or would you like us to review each of those items? I think you should review each of them. I mean, it's just, it, it'd just be easier for all of us, I think, to, to be on the same sure. page. Okay, no, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I think I think what I would like to suggest um, is that maybe uh, Mike, if you were willing to review uh, the drawings that have been modified in your in your site uh, drawing package, uh, we could start sure. with that, and I would be happy to go through um, the uh, the written responses to the other board's uh, suggestions uh, uh, after that. Okay, great. Um, I just also want to add, Chris, that we also um, submitted a revised management plan, which, you know, we updated information about the um, the lighting, parking, and signage. Um, and yes, so, but I don't I don't know if we, you know, I don't think we necessarily need to go over over that information. You should have it in your packet. I, um, I, Mike, I think I thank you for reminding me about that. I think what I would suggest is maybe just a very quick review of the of the items that have been updated, those items you mentioned, and just a, a, a quick uh, description of, of how those items have been updated. I think that would be a good a good start okay. before you dive into the site site package. All right, let me I'll start with that and I'll just try to describe what we've done instead of sharing it. But basically we've updated the parking information to reflect that there's 25 spaces. 22 of which are on site and three on street parking spaces so that we're you know using those 25 total spaces to comply with the what we calculated um, you know as being required by the zoning um, <clears throat> formula for uh, public square footage in the building um, and then on the lighting um, we did uh, quite a bit of work on the site lighting but um, basically, we just uh, reiterated that we have the two site, um, the pole fixtures along the sidewalk. These have been slightly uh, moved away from the entrance and I'll, I'll put up the site lighting photometric plan shortly. Um, but we also noted that the um, there's gonna be um, ceiling mounted L small LED fixtures at the entry. And we had uh, those added to the photometric so that lighting contribution from those um, ceiling lights is also included in the revised photometric plan. Um, and then we also noted that the addition um, is planned to have like bu a building mounted sign with um, like a low light wash. But um, on the site lighting plan, you'll see that there's some examples of like backlit lettering. So you get the glow of the letters. Um, I think you, you've hopefully you've seen some examples of that um, uh, on different projects. Um, and then with the signage also, you know, uh, just to reiterate, we, we changed that or revised that to note that there'll be, um, you know, individual letters on, on the north facade of the building at the entry that say, uh, and hopefully this is still correct, Chris, North Amherst Library or North Amherst Public Library. Those are the words that were shown in the, um, the color rendering that Chris um, uh, presented last time. So th those are the correct. changes in the management plan. And um, so that was just brought up to date, so to speak. Um, I will find, let's see, whoops. My... All right, are you guys seeing the photometric plan on your screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So this is the revised photometric and I plotted it out in color or with color so you can kind of see the, you know, the intensity of the lighting, but I just wanna first go over. So this is the, you know, the pole fixture, the acorn style pole fixture and the photometric plan, we had added 180 degree shields on the backside uh, you'll note here in the key in the table, uh, you know, uh, those fixtures are, are indicated on the plan by the notation B180. Uh, and then at the um, entry canopy, these smaller pink circles labeled DL, I guess it, maybe it stands for downlight. <laughs> I didn't come up with the uh, nomenclature, 
but um, and those are right here. You'll see those at the entry in in the ceiling of the canopy, and then these B one hundred and eighty fixtures. Uh, we push them a little bit farther away because the the overlap in the lighting here in the center at the park at the handicap parking spaces. You know there was a lot of overlap, and part of the reason was you know to re you know we didn't need all that lighting concentrated there. Um, it's 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 not necessarily a bad thing, but we could get a little bit of lighting out toward the sidewalks on Montague Road and Sunderland Road here. You'll see in the green. Um, where there's kind of, I guess we'll call that a medium level of light. Um, but one thing that this does also is previously this particular pole was kind of a few feet, maybe five feet to the, to the uh, east. And that essentially kind of, you know, blocked the view of where the sign building sign, uh, building mounted sign was going to be. So we pushed it out a little bit away so it's you know, off of the edge of the, off the corner of the building. So it wouldn't, um, uh, you know, cause a visual um, obstruction. And as an example of the uh, individual um, letters, these are numbers, but of course you can see that they're, they're basically solid facing the front and they're basically have a back, they're backlit. And so they create a glow against the, um, the plaque on which they would be mounted on the building. Um, it's quite a really a, quite a nice effect. It, it's a very low level of light, um, and then the wires would come in from you know from the probably I'm not Chris. I think that these would come out. They they might come out of a couple of different um, penetrations through the wall, um, and then you know go to the back of each letter. I'm not sure if, if yes. each, each letter gets a hole, <laughs> you know, in the wall. I. I, the wall I Yes, that, that's exactly right. Um, because we don't want wires running right. between the, the, the letters and the sign. Yeah, you, Each you letter will have its own illumination, its own right. wiring, but that wiring will, uh, will, will uh, have its own penetration through the sign panel behind. So, um, so, so the wiring won't be seen. Right. And, and each letter will have its own illumination. The, the, the idea being that what we really want to highlight here is the letters and not necessarily anything on the building itself. And this is a very targeted way of providing illumination um, yeah. and, 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 and allowing those letters to be silhouetted in a way that makes them extremely readable at night. Right. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it's a low level solution. So there isn't a lot of, uh, or there isn't any extraneous light. It really is uh, light that's focused directly on, on, on each of those um, uh, uh, illuminated letters. Yeah, yeah. So, yep, the wires would all be hidden. And then, um, you know, you'll see that, you know, in the red, obviously, this is kind of like where you're going to get the higher intensity over the parking lot coverage. On the north side here, you know, in, in a parking lot such as this, you would typically have lighting on both sides, like along this edge and along that edge of the stalls. But knowing that, you know, the north side is going to change to some degree in the future you know we didn't add any lighting there that's why we have kind of like these you know 0.2 to 0.3 to 0.4 uh, foot candle levels of light um, but you have to keep in mind I think I think the new uh, guidelines for parking lots is is 0.2 foot candles so we are meeting that across all across that northern edge uh, with this light and one um, thing you'll note is with the 180 degree shields You'll see that you know with the pole poles right here, there's very very little backlight. Um, if you note these this weird shape, this is kind of like a, a template, the template of the light distribution at you know I think it's point uh, point two five or something or point three, and then this inner line is like basically point five foot candles. Um, but in the back here, you'll see that that line it's a real sharp cutoff, so there's very low glare or back or light you know going backwards from the light uh from the source with these 180 degree shields um so that helps control the light you know that we don't need you know in the back and especially on this side we don't need light you know in the back and glaring off the building so i think that this it turned out rather well um and and we actually had the um the lighting rep I think he did four iterations for us, you know, in terms of 
you know, 180 degree shield or, or 120 degree shield. Uh, he, you know, he moved the light poles around actually a couple of times. Um, he couldn't mimic the, the, the individually backlit um, letters here, but all along the building, I think we had like basically 0.1 foot candle um, of light back here at the building wall. It's 0.2 right there. And then these are 0.1, uh, the next kind of row or the next grid back. So we're somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2. Uh, you also have to keep in mind, um, you know, that this, this, these are ground level measurements. Um, so there is, there might be some light on, on the wall at, at knee height or something, for instance, but you're not gonna have a conflict with, um, you know, with this, you know, wonderful glow effect for the, for the signage. So that's basically the only plan that really changed. We can talk about the, the comments about adding green space on the north, but um, I, can't, I can't remember, Chris, if that was addressed in one of your comments. We might wanna talk about that or do you want me to mention it now? I, I, I'm happy to address that as part of my, uh, okay. my review right. of, of the comments we provided. Okay, I guess I'll let you take it away with the, um, you know, responses to the DRB and DAAC. Um, all right. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, let's see here. I am going to um, uh, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so what, what I did was I, I took all the comments from the DRB and the DAAC, uh, I formatted them on our letterhead, and then provided our responses in, uh, in blue. So I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to identify the issue uh, on each of these items and, and, and read our response. Um, and I'm happy to take questions uh, if anybody has questions afterwards. Um, so the DRB had 14, I believe it's 14 uh, suggestions. Number one was making sure that the roof could structurally support uh, uh, roof mounted solar panels. Uh, and we will certainly make sure that the roof truss design and the structure of the roof will allow those PV panels to be installed either as part of the initial build out or in the future. Um, Number two was whether the, uh, the river birch, uh, the proposed river birch would, would be too large. Uh, Mike and I reviewed that and uh, we did remove that as part of the planting plan and changed it to a smaller uh, tree, a, a service berry tree. Correct, correct. Uh, which, which will have, a, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a height of 12 to 15 feet at maturity, something like that. Right, and, and it's a native cultivar, and um, it, it's one of my favorite trees, actually, because they produce really delicious berries, and I, I have to fight with the birds to get at them. Okay, so so that that tree should not uh, really begin to compete with the addition or or uh, uh, overshadow the the entry. Uh, number three was uh, suggesting to consider staining or painting of the new wood shingles on the addition. Um, and what, what we are proposing is that um, in the next uh, phase of design work, we will in fact in explore uh, a painting or staining those shingles. Uh, and this will be done in conjunction with the possibility of repainting the existing building. Um, um, it, it, it's not uncommon when uh, a new addition is added to an existing building, even if the existing building is in pretty good condition, that the existing paint job starts to look a little shabby in comparison to the new construction. Uh, so we will explore the idea of repainting the existing building. Um, our feeling is, is that the final color choice, uh, color choices will be made uh, probably during the construction phase. And I say that because we will, uh, we will have a, a, a section of the building that will be painted in the proposed color. Uh, we will review it on site in the actual light conditions, et cetera, and, and we'll make a, fi a final decision at that point. Uh, but we will explore uh, some options in the next design phase um, uh, for, for painting or staining as opposed to the natural, uh, natural shingles. 
Uh, number four was the color, uh, uh, reconsider the color choice for the proposed building trim. And I would say essentially the same thing that we will reconsider that um, as part of the overall color scheme for the addition. Uh, number five, uh, reconsider the layout of the uh, and size of the larger windows in the addition. So um, it, our, our feeling is, is that we have provided a, a, as a base, as a, a kind of a foundation of fenestration and, and windows in this addition, we have taken uh, the exact window um, uh, from the existing building, the, the double hung window with the eight light transom above. And we have replicated that uh, around this building in, in a number of places. But our feeling is, is that the, uh, the meeting room uh, that we really would like to provide a, 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 a larger window to provide a better view into the building uh, from the outside and also to provide uh, more light to come into that space, um, especially on the north side where there will not be direct light and also to provide a better connection to the surrounding uh, uh, landscape and surrounding site. Um, our feeling is, is that uh, the, the, the addition as a whole uh, is, has a very, very strong connection to the existing building in terms of its massing, in terms of its uh, proportion, in terms of its materials, trim, uh, most of the windows. And our feeling is that it's, it's, uh, it's really very appropriate to, to kind of break out of that existing condition mold um, and, and provide these, uh, just the, these two double windows as a larger, more contemporary uh, window. And our feeling is that it's, um, it allows the addition to be seen as, as, a, as a more contemporary addition, that it's not something of the same time period as the existing building. Um, number six is provide signage for the library. Uh, we did review that. We will have a building mounted sign that will be rear illuminated. Uh, number seven, uh, provide a buffer uh, or a vegetated buffer between the walkway and the parking spaces as a safety measure. Uh, we reviewed that and we believe that the curb that's provided, uh, that'll be uh, the, the dividing point between the parking spaces and the five foot wide walkway uh, will be adequate as a safety measure. Um, this is uh, certainly a typical detail for head and parking uh, that can be seen throughout uh, the town of Amherst. And, and we believe it, it, it will provide uh, a, a safe barrier between vehicles and, and pedestrians. Uh, number eight, the style of the proposed benches uh, should be consistent with the existing benches on site. Um, so the proposed bench is similar in style. Uh, the existing benches on the south side have a metal frame with wood or composite slats for sitting. Uh, that's uh, what the new bench uh, uh, will be as well. Uh, so we feel that that is consistent. Uh, number nine, uh, determine the condition of the existing benches and consider replacing them. Uh, as part of the next design phase, we will uh, do an assessment of the condition of those benches. Uh, I, I believe they're in pretty good shape, although the the wood uh, does need to be looked at a little more closely and we will make a recommendation to the town um, as to whether they need to be refinished or replaced um, at that time. Number 10, provide a bike rack on site. Uh, we do have a bike rack that's been added to the north side of the proposed addition next to uh, the bench location. Uh, number 11, uh, if the existing building walls are to be repainted, the colors should be more consistent with the colors of the proposed building addition. Uh, so I would just say that, uh, as I said, we will consider repainting the existing building as well as painting or staining uh, the addition in the next design phase. Uh, number 12, uh, make sure the architectural style and details of the proposed building addition are consistent with the existing building. Um, I, I, I do think that largely they are. I know that there are a couple of instances where we have uh, taken uh, some, some liberties. But again, in the next design phase, we will certainly review that. Uh, and anything that seems uh, uh, really out of place, uh, we will uh, take a look at, at trying to make that uh, more compatible and more harmonious with the existing building. 
Uh, number 13, remove the, the circle uh, uh, under the round arch in the gable to the left of the entry. That's been removed. Uh, and we simply have a, a, a straight piece of head trim there. Uh, and that was represented in the, in the, the, the drawings we shared last week. Uh, number 14, if the town decides to seek a, uh, an architectural access board variance request to maintain the south entry, that the DRB uh, supports that. Um, we will uh, uh, be talking with the town in the next design phase to see if we will in fact be seeking a, a, an AAB variance for that. But it's uh, certainly good to have the DRB's support for that. Uh, and then the, uh, the DAAC suggestions, uh, number one, a bell uh, should, be should be placed at the chairlift location uh, so that uh, uh, operator can uh, alert staff, um, library staff for assistance. We will place a, a bell uh, as part of that uh, chairlift assembly. Uh, number two, look into whether a backup generator uh, for the chairlift is feasible to provide. Uh, in the next design phase, we will certainly look at that. Um, there are some, uh, uh, some code requirements and, and possible code restrictions as to whether or not, uh, as to what can be put on the backup generator, uh, but we will look into that. And if it's, uh, if it's feasible to do that, uh, we will certainly explore, explore that. Um, and, and, and if the code allows it and, and uh, a budget permits, it seems like that would be a good, a good idea. Um, number three, keep the south facing door as an entrance and the D, uh, DAAC uh, supported that as well. Uh, so we will determine in the next design phase if we're gonna be seeking that variance. And again, it's, it's certainly good to have the DAAC uh, support for that. Uh, number four, provide a place of refuge uh, interior uh, uh, of the library building. Um, we uh, th really the only place that we can see doing that is in the existing entry vestibule uh, at that south entry. Uh, we do believe we can place an area of, of refuge there potentially uh, if the stairs to the basement and the stairs to the attic are removed. So we will explore doing that. Um, and, and if we can get the required uh, 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 rating of those, of those walls and those assemblies in that area, uh, I think that we can provide at least one um, uh, wheelchair space, uh, area of refuge space there. Uh, so we will look into that in the next design phase. Uh, number five, widen the hallway leading from the lobby to the restrooms in the addition. Um, we will in fact uh, uh, widen that hallway to meet the uh, AAB standards. We're just a little bit shy uh, in that hallway and, and so that'll be enlarged. Uh, and number six, which was added by the planning staff uh, to provide two hearing aid compatible receivers in the new uh, community meeting room. Uh, that is in fact what the AAB requires. And so we will provide two assistive listening systems uh, to that meeting room. Um, so those are, those are uh, all the comments and, and responses. Uh, before I dig into the, uh, our approach for uh, how, how we're proposing to handle the, the paving on the north side of the parking lot. Are there any uh, questions or clarifications I can make uh, on these? Uh, I have just the place of refuge I'm not familiar with. Oh, um, so the place of refuge, uh, uh, it, it, it basically is a, 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 a waiting area for someone who is wheelchair bound, who cannot go downstairs or uh, you know, get out of the building, a building like this that, that may not have an accessible path. It provides them with a fire rated place where they can uh, uh, shelter in place until emergency services can come and safely get them out of the building. Uh, the way it works is that the, uh, the fire department and, and emergency services of the town will be told about this place of refuge. Uh, if there is an emergency at the building, uh, I believe that's one of the first things that they do is try to make sure that anybody who is sheltering in that space can be safely, uh, safely uh, removed from the building. Very good. Thank you, uh, Chris. Yep. Uh, okay. Chris, so I think there was a little misunderstanding about number seven under DRB comments. Um, yes, I think Tom Long brought this issue up. So he was talking about providing a vegetative buffer um, 
I believe he was talking about it. I could be wrong. Beyond the northern row of parking. Maybe he could clarify that, but that's what I thought he meant, that he wanted a vegetable <coughs> buffer up there in lieu of that um, grassy swale. So maybe you could ask Tom what exactly he meant by, by or what the DRB meant by this comment, because I think it yeah, was- so th Those are two different comments. And so I think um, Chris is gonna address the Northern edge of the parking lot in a moment is what I just gathered. Um, yes. This was more about a safety measure assuring that the sidewalk and the parking lot at the front of the building. So this is on the South side of the parking lot. So cars wouldn't be able to drive up onto the parking area or onto the sidewalk area. So it was more people concerned with safety in terms of vehicles um, entering the, the pedestrian area. Um, so that was addressed in, in this particular case. Thank you. So good, uh, uh, Johanna, you, are you there? Your, your hand is raised, it's been raised. I'm gonna make sure. Thanks, I'm here. I, I just had a quick question about the lighting plan. I don't know if now is the best time to do that or not. Sure. How do we go back to that? <clears throat> I feel like I'm, um, I'm like the squeaky wheel on bikes, but having rummaged through a pannier on the back of my bike, and um, I'm just noting that the lighting seems to be really focused on the car-centric parts of the parking lot and doesn't really reach the bike spot. And I wonder if just a little adjustment could fix that. So um, we do have, you, you can see the numbers represent, I, I believe the foot candles. So uh, we do have, you know, uh, between 0.4 and 0.3 foot candles here at the bench and at, at, the, at the, uh, the bike racks. I, and I believe that is within the, the guidelines. Uh, Mike, did you say of the, yeah. the town? Um, yeah, for, right, for a sidewalk, um, they're, we're trying to get point uh, level of 0.3 on the walkway and I think that those are 0.3 there if I mean you know this is a pretty I think the lighting rep just basically used the same setup for each pole but you know if if I mean I don't I don't want to I you know I certainly would hope that we could get an approval with a condition to change this but we could look at not having the shield or using a, a 90 degree shield or you know a, something less than a 180 on this particular fixture and then you'd get some of the backwash which would help uh, a bicyclist at night that's a good point i, I mean I, I i guess just being the devil's advocate here i, I do think um that while the, the 0 0.4, 0 0.3 foot candles uh, that is represented in this photometric plan isn't as high as the, the 0.5 to you know, 0.8 or even 0.9 uh, out here of the, of the parking area, it, that is still a perfectly serviceable uh, uh, yeah. amount of light, even though it's lower than the parking area. These, you know, these, these right. bike rack, this, this area where the bike rack is, will not be a dark area. Right, it's, it's hard to, I mean, obviously when you're out there, there's obviously, you know, a gradual fall off of the lighting where it's most intense versus where it's most dark. It doesn't just stop all of a sudden and, you know, and there's no light. Um, so, you know, but Chris, you bought, yep, that's very true. It's not completely dark there. There is a serviceable level of light, um, you know, but it, we, you know, we can offer it to, to change that if if you're really you know concerned about it um i mean uh, it's so hard because we live in a world that isn't built for bicyclists and so when you know and but like when i see the 0 0.1 right next to the spot where i think maybe the front wheel of the bicycle would go it's a little hard to say how the racks are oriented I presume that the racks would be going perpendicular to the walkway. Yeah, we might turn right now. There's two racks shown toward the back of that pad, and and honestly, I might I might switch that back. They got drafted that way. I might turn them 90 degrees, you know, so they're they're side by side, if you will, rather than end to end. Right, because as it is right now, you could at max park two bikes there, whereas if you put them perpendicular, you could park four, one on each side of the rack. Yeah, the two middle. If you try to get four there the two middle ones would be 
pretty tight and touching each other, for instance. So I think, you know, right. they, that got changed and they got turned, but I think I would turn them back to be anyway, food for thought, you know, it's, it's not, it's a little bit of my hill to die on. So, okay. But. I, um, I think I think what I would suggest is that we will certainly review um, yep. you know the lighting requirements and the lighting recommendations for for this sort of a condition. I, I, I mean I, I I will say that our intention is absolutely to provide adequate light for anyone using this site, including bicycle bicyclists and including pedestrians. Um, and if we do find that these light levels are low. Uh, as Mike says, I think there are a number of ways we can talk with the lighting manufacturer to ensure that we get a higher level of light here to meet the requirements of, of, of that bike rack area. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Uh, Janet? Um, I'd like to um, join Johanna on the lighting, dying on the lighting hill. I think that it's really important that the users of the library you know, however they get there, have enough light to see by. So I think, I wonder if you could just pull the pole back a little bit, it would give some more light to the, pull it sort of southward, it might help. But um, I'm not sure, I thought this was brought up at the last meeting, or I think it was just in the draft um, conditions, but the draft condition had all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant, exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and not shine onto adjacent properties and streets. And so um, those acorn lights, which I know are in the downtown, um, those aren't um, down, like downcast. And so I was hoping that, I mean, I'd like to see that light being downcast and not shining into the sky because that's not dark sky compliant. And then also to add a condition that we turn off the lights after business hours, except for site security and visitor and employee safety. I don't know that that necessarily means that all the lights have to go off when the last person leaves, because it seems to me that people might be using the library to drop off books after hours as I do. And I'm not quite sure where their book drop off is, but I, I would like to see that condition reflect the bylaws requirements and also just to have downcast lighting. And I was kind of wondering if the design review board had looked at those acorn lights because they seem kind of Clark Kent, Lois Lane, like 50s not really um, the era of the building, but um, so I, I just wanted to, that's, I'm worrying about that condition. I don't want to have light shining up into the sky at night. Sure. No, I, I, that's, a, that's a, a, a valid concern and you're absolutely right that um, I think we are required to have a dark sky compliant fixture. Mike, my, my uh, understanding of, of the acorn light was that while it does in fact have the the kind of historic uh, gl glass globe uh, that it didn't that it didn't illuminate uh, all all up into the sky that it was shielded so that it focused light downward is is, is that correct or is yeah, that incorrect? Yeah, I, I mean the, the the original or old style of this you know this kind of acorn you know uh, well all the old lights had a bulb so mm -hmm. the bulb in itself was casting light you know in all in 360 or you know a spherical direction. The LEDs are laid out or, or set up so that the light source is actually on a plate that's mounted in the light, you know, so it's, it's like there's the plate inside, um, inside the globe, if you will, with the LEDs, you know, mounted on the bottom of the plate. So they're, they're directed, their light is directed downwards and outwards and so not the, up. So that I, that's my understanding of how these are, you know, but we can. So are the knobs at the top just decorative, that glass? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, good. I feel better. So I would just add in that you turn the lights off at night, but I also think um, the lights on the door would be security. And then I'm not sure where your book drop is, but I would love to not have people creeping around in the night looking for the book drop. So that could keep your lights on all night. So, so these, these two lights, uh, which are uh, recessed in the ceiling, they're uh, recessed down lights. Mm -hmm. um, these are what will provide illumination, you know, from the walkway into the entry of the building. On this west side of that entry, that's where the uh, after hours book drop is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could certainly look into uh, keeping these lights on maybe at a reduced uh, level of illumination so that, so that that front entry is always illuminated, but not at the same level as when the library is open. 
Yeah. Uh, so if someone does come and, and wants to return a book, uh, there'll be you know a certain amount of illumination uh, uh, in this general area. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure I would object to having the the, the taller lights because it seems like. So yeah, you know, I mean, I think that that. Dark. The LEDs, uh, my understanding is, I'm not the lighting expert, but with the LEDs, you can program them too, so that, for instance, at a certain time, they can go down to 50% power. You know, yeah. Suppose, you know, I, I don't know if you have to pay extra for that package uh, of controls to be able to do that, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be very easy to do this with the light, so that's, that's a really great advantage for energy savings, while still providing that security, you know, a low, low level of security on a, on a site. Yeah, and I like the idea of lowering the lights at night, but still having people be able to see the walkway so they're not just stumbling up to the, you know, the, the entrance and things like that. So that change would be fantastic with me because I think it would comply with the bylaw and then, you know, also be helpful, so. I'll, um, I'll have a talk with Guilford about that and see what, you know, how they're, how, what you know what the town is currently using and if they have that option to um you know dim the lights and if not you know I, whether they can wanna, start doing that i don't want to shroud the walkways in night at you know at two in the morning if people are using that and i i know people do drop off books in the middle of the night so well uh, there's some i guess you you must be a night bird huh <laughs> two two a.m dropping off books they have a lot of catholic guilt <laughs> so I, I, I'll just reiterate what, what Mike just said. We will certainly talk with Guilford and the town about exactly how the site illumination is programmed, uh, you know, to make sure that it's safe uh, even after hours and to make sure that, um, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're providing a welcoming environment for anyone using the library even after hours for the book drop. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, are there any other um, you know Janet uh, uh, Chris you had your hand up briefly and then it's down but now it's up okay so there was there was one issue that Chris Farley wanted to talk about with regard to the treatment of the pavement on the um, parking lot I think a suggestion had been made with regard to using porous concrete pavers and, and he has, he sent an email which I forwarded or Jan, uh, maybe Pam forwarded it to everybody. Um, it, it arrived at about six o'clock at night, I think. But anyway, um, Chris could explain what that email said. Sure, uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So uh, there, there was a fair amount of discussion at the last meeting about trying to reduce the amount of pavement on this uh, Northern part of the site. Uh, which, you know, I think is certainly our, our ultimate goal as part of this project. Um, however, what we are proposing is that um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly different kind of phased approach uh, to how, how the, the development of this northern part of the site is treated. So uh, when we added these, the, these 12 spaces uh, here to the north side, uh, the intention is, and, and what's represented in this plan, is that, that those parking spaces would largely be on existing paving. So we wouldn't be removing old paving and putting new paving in. We would be utilizing the existing paving. And, and our feeling is, is that makes it, that makes it economical. It makes it ecological, at least in the, in the short term for, the, for this project. And that's with the understanding that uh, when the realignment of Sunderland Road uh, over to Montague Road comes along, um, and, and we've confirmed this with Guilford, this entire north end of, of the site, including these parking spaces, will likely be part of that construction project. So it is very possible that these spaces uh, uh, will, will, will be maintained, but they may be repaved as part of that project and that everything to the north of them will also be uh, redeveloped. And, and I, I think the intention is that at that time, uh, we would be able to increase the, uh, uh, the planting, uh, do the grassy swale, do the, the, the rain gardens or additional plantings. It's difficult to say exactly what that landscape plan might be, but I think 
Um, uh, we and Guilford have acknowledged that that would be one of the goals of that, re of that realignment project. And part of the reason why we're proposing not doing it now is that the, the, the two schedules uh, for the project, the, the, the library uh, project and the realignment project are only a couple of years apart. And what we would, what we would like to, to propose is not to do, uh, not to put a lot of, uh, of money and resources into redeveloping that Northern part of the lot only to have that torn up as part of the realignment project. Um, so we'd like to try to live with what's there now uh, again, for, for economical and ecological reasons, and look uh, a little further down the line at uh, providing something that is, that is greener and, and more, more ultimately more ecological and, and more beautiful to look at as part of that larger uh, realignment project. So, so that's our proposal at, at, this, at this point. Very good. Um, any other? Uh, questions from the board? Uh, Janet? Um, I'm not sure if this is the right moment, but I was hoping that um, in the conditions that we would include the commitments made in the letter um, of April 20th, 21, instead of like putting them individually into the conditions, just referencing the letter. But it, I don't know if we should talk about that now or like what the next phase is. I don't know if Chris has any guidance. I think Chris? you can talk, if you can start to talk about conditions and um, findings if you're finished asking questions. Well, you also might want to take some uh, comments from the public if they have any comments. Yeah, we'll do that first. Okay, so we will move on to uh, public comment. Any? Any of the uh, attendees in the public uh, have any comments on this project? Okay, I see none. So um, any other comments by the board? Uh, if not, I think uh, Chris, you, you were gonna go through the, the, the conditions and um, Site plan review criteria. Area. Yeah. Let me see what my... um, uh, Chris and the board, would you like me to, to go ahead and keep this uh, site plan up or should I stop sharing? I think it would be helpful to keep it up. Yeah. Okay. I'd be, I'm happy to do that. So um, I can go through the findings first and um, then Janet can make uh, suggestions about how to reword the lighting finding if she um, wants to do that. Um, so these are the board um, finds under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw site plan review as follows. And you all received a copy of this in your packet. Um, 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and the goals of the master plan. And if you find that um, something isn't to your liking, you can raise your hand and Jack will recognize you. Um, 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed use of the property is unlikely to create detrimental or offensive actions. 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. A condition of the site plan review approval will require that lights be downcast and shielded. 11.24, did Janet have a question about that or comment? Oh, she did, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I kind of, I kind of spaced out. Um, and I would just say adjacent properties and extinguished after business hours, except for site security and user safety. Business hours, except for site security and user and safety. And user safety. That was kind of general enough. Okay. Okay. Um, Eleven point two four zero three is not applicable. The provision of recreational facilities is not relevant to this use. 11.2410, 
Unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. The North Amherst Library is an historic feature of the North Amherst Village Center. The building will be protected by the construction of the new addition because the addition with its bathrooms, meeting room, and wheelchair lift and its improved parking will extend the use of the library to more residents of the town and will extend its use into the future. The demolition of a portion of the north wall has been reviewed and approved by the Historical Commission. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. 11.2412, the project will be connected to town sewer and water. The town engineer has reviewed and has not expressed concerns about the town services or their ability to serve the proposed use. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has reviewed and has not expressed concerns about the proposed stormwater management system. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on site. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are considered to be adequate to control so <coughs> soil erosion during and after construction. 11.2416, <coughs> excuse me, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. This is a small project. The site is surrounded by roadways and to the north by property owned by the applicant in the town, of, which is the town of Amherst. Chris, do you want me to, do you want me to read anything <laughs> like you? Yeah. I think I can get through it. Let's oh, okay. <laughs> if I need... Take a drink of water or something. Oh, I will. That's a good All idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 11.2417, uh, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast and shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. Anything to add to that? Uh, I see no hands raised. Okay. Um, 11.2418 is not applicable. The property is not lo located in a flood prone conservancy district. 11.2419, not applicable. There are no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the area of proposed work. The project has received a negative determination of applicability from the Conservation Commission with regard to its impact on nearby wetland resources. 11.2420, the Planning Board did not choose to refer to the design principles and standards set forth in sections 3.3040 and 3.2041. I think that first one might have been 3.20. Or, oh, but anyway, um, the design review principles and standards, because the project was reviewed favorably by the design review board, which has transmitted its findings to the planning board. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. 11.2422, Building sites shall avoid to the extent fe feasible, the impact on slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are no steep slopes or floodplains on the site. The applicant has located the proposed addition behind the existing historic building to avoid affecting scenic views. The profile of the addition is smaller than that of the existing building, and there are no severe grade changes proposed, and there are no floodplains on site. 11.2423, uh, not applicable. The existing garage building located to the north of the library is expected to be demolished. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate via a wood fence proposed to surround the mechanical units on the west side of the connector. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of the vehicular and pedestrian movement both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. Additional parking has been added to the site so that library patrons will have access to on-site parking and fewer patrons will need to cross the street to gain access to the building. 11.2431, the location of the curb cut has been designed to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. The town engineer has reviewed the location of the curb cut in relation to the adjacent roadways 
and intersections as, and has found it to be satisfactory. Uh, 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, and sidewalks has been provided in a safe and convenient manner. There are no loading areas. Excuse me, I have a dog here and I'm watching what he's doing. <laughs> 11.2433, not applicable. Provision for access to adjoining properties is not an issue. 11.2434, the proposed access driveway is appropriately located. There are no access driveways across from the site on the west side of Sunderland Road. The driveway into Monta onto Montague Road is proposed to be eliminated. 11.2435, not applicable. Joint access driveways between adjoining properties is not an issue. Access to the existing garage building site is off Montague Road, north of the library site. 11.2436, the requirement for a submittal of a traffic impact statement will be waived. The applicant has submitted a letter prepared by the Berkshire Design Group indicating that the amount of traffic that is expected to enter and leave the site is relatively small. 11.2437, not applicable because no traffic impact report will be required. Is Very good. Okay? Um, and any comment on, on that portion from the board? I see none. And we have, um, uh, the, we can discuss the conditions. Do I need the conditions? If we propose, yeah, I think that um, if, if you, I, I can read them or you can, so. I'll read them until my okay. voice comes out and then you can read them. <laughs> okay, uh, general conditions. Um, the first one is development shall be built substantially in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved on, and if you approve it tonight, I'll put tonight's date in. Um, the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on. Again, it will be tonight's date if you approve it tonight. Um, Janet may have some more wording for this number three. Um, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. And what um, what language should we add to this? I think Janet just yeah. I think just the same thing and be extinguished after business hours, except for site security and user safety. Aww. Is that the dog? It is. <laughs> she makes that noise when she is happy to see me. Mm. Excuse me. It's a it's a dog that we're babysitting. Ah. Uh. <laughs> uh, number four: changes to the project and/or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the buildings shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and/or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the, oh, of the site plan review approval. I guess I must have written this before um, we decided no special permit was needed. Okay, so scratch that. Scratch special permit, yep. Number five, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loaned and seeded unless otherwise specified. Number six, an ANR plan, an ANR plan shall be submitted to the planning board to establish a new property line at the north side of the addition. Number seven, when final colors are chosen for the addition, the applicant shall return to the planning board to present the color choices for review. Um, the next conditions are all about con uh, construction. Um, Number eight, prior to the issuance of any building permit, a pre-construction meeting shall be scheduled with the applicant, the applicant's contractor, the town engineer, building commissioner, superintendent of public works, planning staff, fire chief, and any other staff personnel that may have a role in the construction of the project. Number nine, a written construction fire management plan shall be submitted to the fire chief and building commissioner prior to the issuance of a building permit. 
Number 10, if the library is to remain open during construction, the applicant shall submit a plan to the planning board and the building commissioner for review and approval, describing visitor parking and safe access during construction. Number 11, a construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover the following items. Construction timeline and expected completion dates for each phase, location of parking for contractors, location of on-site and off-site staging, such as for construction vehicles, including cement trucks, location of fencing around construction site, details and locations of directional marketing and job signs related to construction, emergency contract contact information, such as name and cell phone number of the developer and contractor, information about construction signs, including advertising signs for contractor, developer, and architect, the company affiliation name and address and business telephone number of the construction superintendent who shall have over, overall responsibility for site activities on the project site. Proof that Dig Safe has been notified at least 72 hours prior to the start of any work. Any other relevant information that they may request. The construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. Construction activity shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Saturday. Um, B, parking for contractors shall be restricted to the project site. Um, I'm not sure if, um, if the uh, architect has any comments. Um, and I see that two hands are raised. Yes. Um, so Janet, do you have a comment? I'm sorry, I was, I was gonna wait till you're done with the, um, that monotonous construction section, but um, I was wondering if we could add the language to um, condition number seven, where it talks about the, you know, coming back to the planning board for, you know, final color choices. And then maybe we could just, you know, without having to add another condition number, just say the commitments made in the Coon Riddle letter of April 20th, 2021 shall be implemented. If that's an easy way to stick that in. I would put that as a separate condition, I think. Okay. Maybe it gets its own number, but then it changes all your numbering. That's okay. Okay. Commitments made in commit can read a letter of April 20, 21, 20, 2021 shall be, be implemented. Be implemented. Thank you. Is that, is that awkward? That's good. Okay. Um, Andrew. Andrew. Uh, thanks. Yeah, mine will hopefully be pretty quick too. I, I guess, first of all, is there any logic to the bold face pattern in here and italicize? Is that, uh, just curious if that's meant to call anything out in particular? Um, there were changes made to this set of uh, conditions. I think I issued this several weeks ago and um, recently changed it as of April 16th. So I bold italicized things that were changed. Got it. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure, um, I guess on seven in terms of returning to the planning board to present the ch color choices for review. So will we continue to keep this open until that time? No, once you, if you approve these conditions and findings, then um, this hearing uh, would be closed. You would approve the, the application. And then um, in the future, uh, the building commissioner would make sure that these, uh, that these conditions are um, adhered to. Very good. And then um, on 12B, I, that one as well, in terms of the contractors should be restricted to the project site. Would we envision them using the municipal lot? Like, well, I guess let me start. Do we do we feel like the the town is going to be interested in keeping this library open during construction? I know that was referenced in here as well, uh, one of the other conditions. We don't know. And okay. what I'm viewing as the project site encompasses the um, property to the north of the library, which is the area that includes the former garage. So in my opinion, it looks like there's enough room on that uh, parcel north of the parking lot to accommodate uh, 
contractor's parking, but that's why I put this little note, this condition may need to be amended. And I was going to ask um, Mr. Farley and Mr. Liu if they thought that the contractor's needs could be met on these two sites, 5A37 and 5A38. Um, I, 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 I would imagine so, given the fact that the project is relatively small. Um, I think that the on-site needs can be can be met here. If there is off-site staging that is needed or off-site storage that is needed, I think that's something that will be provided separately by the contractor. Um, I, I, as to whether or not the library will remain open, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we will certainly uh, engage with the town uh, on, on, on that issue. I will say that uh, I don't think there's any way that any of this parking can be utilized during construction, uh, just because it's in such close proximity right. to, to, the, to the new addition and yep. to the site. So I, I don't think we're gonna be able to provide any on-site parking uh, during construction. And, and that may or may not play into whether the town decides to keep this library open during construction. Makes sense. So then that that uh, 11D around the, the location of the fencing, that would essentially encompass the construction site and that surface parking in 5A37? Well, yeah, I think most likely, yeah. Very good. That's all I had, thanks. Okay, let's see, I think we were on 12. Is that everybody? Is yes. everybody asked questions? Okay. So 12 um, C, there shall be no parking about or idling of construction trucks and equipment in any public right of way. D, any blasting or hammering of rock or material will be shall be noticed to town officials and abutters 24 hours in advance and completed between nine and three. That's probably not applicable, but we'll leave it in anyway, um, unless there's an objection. Um, 13, as part of the building permit application, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner the name, address, and business telephone number of the project manager or on-site supervisor who shall be responsible for all activities on the project site. These are kind of boilerplate um, conditions. 14, there shall be no exterior construction activity, including fueling of vehicles on the project site before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays, New Year's Day, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department and or inspection services. 15, the project site shall be fenced during construction. Is that the same as one other of these? No, sorry. Um, 16, appropriate measures shall take place to control dust, dirt, debris, and construction materials on the site. Water for dust control should be trucked in from offsite unless otherwise approved by the Department of Public Works. 17, all catch basins shall be protected from soil and debris contamination during construction and shall be cleaned at the end of construction. 18, no stumps, demolition material, or construction debris shall be buried or disposed of at the project site. 19, the town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. 20, the applicant shall provide as-built plans that show building location, grades, access ways, parking areas, sidewalks, and walkways, curbing, stormwater management facilities, lighting, and utilities to the building commissioner, town engineer, and to be placed with the site plan review decision in the planning department. 21, the final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued until the final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, sidewalks and berms has been completed. Landscaping as shown on the plan of record has been installed and as-built plans have been submitted to the building commissioner and town engineer by all design professionals for the site and building construction and have been approved by the building commissioner and town engineer. Looks like Doug has a question. Ms. Mr. Marsh. Oh, Doug. No, I have a comment. Um, when I first came on the board a little over a year ago and sat through the first uh, site plan review that I experienced, I was frankly astonished that these 
boilerplate construction conditions were uh, custom, custom written and custom read every time we did a site plan review. And so since it's been more than a year since I said that, I'd like to say it again. And especially while we're doing a hard look at our zoning uh, regulation or bylaws, um, I think, you know, if we have to, I think there ought to be a better way than to have to have Chris read this every time we do a site plan review. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna do my once a year um, advocacy for, you know, somewhere else, the town's general terms and conditions for construction that we can just reference once and not have to, you know, read every time. Thank you. Any comment on that, Chris? Well, um, it actually helps the building commissioner a lot to have these conditions um, imposed. And I think it is probably a good idea to consider putting them elsewhere. And we'll have to think about where that is. Is that in the zoning bylaw? Is that in the planning board rules and regulations? Is that some general bylaw that we have? Um, and so I can talk to Rob Moore, the building commissioner about that. And he actually is here tonight in case he has any comments. You may want to ask him if he has any comments to that. Um, well, I, I do remember when I mentioned this before that you know, he said there really wasn't any other place where these appeared. Um, but I, I can't believe there isn't somewhere we could park them so that, you know, you have one line to say that the those general terms are included, and then we can go on. And then, yeah, then only mention the, the, the deviation and stick to that. And Good point. Uh, I, will, I will review that um, issue with Rob and we'll try to think of another place to put them. It's sort of like saying a litany, isn't it? For those of you who know about litanies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little bit. Would, would this be a good place to make a motion to accept the findings and can, or adopt the findings and conditions that Chris has read with the edits that Janet requested? Could make a motion to close the public hearing and approve the uh, site plan application with the conditions and the findings as read and Janet has amended. All right, I'm happy to do that. Good, any second? Second. All right, Janet. Uh, any discussion amongst the board? Um, all right, we don't. Okay, I think we just can move on to the, uh, to the vote then, I'm just. Mm -hmm. Looking at all my different windows here. Um, so let's go to a vote then. Uh, Maria? Approved. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna, I think uh, she told us she wouldn't be absent uh, for par uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, myself, yes. So it'd be 6-0. With one absent. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna miss you guys, Mike and Chris. It's like, <laughs> you hang out every, every couple of weeks for a few hours. <laughs> Well, we're happy to be here. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be back on some other project. Happy yeah. to be working on this too. Absolutely. Yes, so um, take you. care. All right, well, thanks for all the comments. Um, you guys always come up with some insight, so appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all your consideration and all your time. Very much appreciated.
Good night. Thanks. Yes. Have, a good, have a good evening. All right. Um, so we can move on to old business or no, uh, how about taking a, a little break right now? It's almost eight, five minute break. We, um, or let's just meet back at eight. So I guess that's more like an eight minute break. Mm -hmm. Is that good? Okay. Proceeding on to old business and topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. And uh, we do have uh, the Bang Center a ramp uh, to discuss that that uh, Chris and uh, Rob can take the lead on. So Rob will present the changes that he's made to the Bang Center ramp. Okay. Hi, good evening, uh, you, Rob. Rob, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, Pam, if you could go ahead and display our plans, that would be great. Okay, can you see it, Rob? Yes, okay, thanks, Pam. Uh, so last time, we were here a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the proposed ramp uh, over at the Bang Center and there were a number of comments, questions and just wanted to give you an update on what we looked at and uh, we held off on putting the project to bid until we did that and now we're, uh, we're hoping to maybe Friday or Monday the latest advertise this. Uh, you know, what we found uh, after we heard some of the comments was uh, we went back and looked at the existing conditions and on the, the upper, the north side of this, uh, uh, this area near the Musanti Health Center, we did find that the existing conditions uh, didn't reflect what was actually out there. It was, it was outdated and, and didn't include the, the more recent work that was done as part of the uh, Musanti Health Center. Uh, where they replaced the sidewalk and, and made a couple of modifications. Uh, so I also went a little further south with the existing conditions shown here uh, to pick up the existing storage shed and some of the electrical equipment just to give a, a better idea of the, uh, the activity that's on this 9,000 square foot parcel. Uh, property line is now shown with uh, its proximity to John's Tavern. Uh, Pam, if you could scroll to the next page, please. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Oh, yeah, back going too many. Yep. <laughs> there this we one? go. That one. Uh, so this is our, uh, our revised proposed plan. Uh, so a couple of comments that were made uh, during our last discussion. One of them was, uh, you know, why is the, the uh, essentially why is the ramp bisecting this, uh, this parcel rather than uh, maybe meandering a little bit more and uh, making it a more convenient walkway rather than a ramp. And uh, you know, thinking about that and talking about it with others, uh, I was reminded that you know the primary goal of this project uh, was to provide an accessible entrance, uh, to a, a better accessible entrance to the Musanti Health Center. That's why we started it years ago. Um, the the health center does have hours or had hours. Uh, you know, outside our normal hours for the Bang Center, uh, certain weeknights and Saturdays, uh, particularly with dental appointments. So there isn't always an option, uh, even outside of COVID, COVID times, uh, there really isn't always an option to enter the building and uh, travel the hallway to the elevator down to the Musanti Health Center. And the only other option right now is to travel from the north side of the building near the west entrance uh, around to the east side of the building uh, and across this long sidewalk, which is about 300 feet of travel. So this, this proposal uh, you know, cuts that, that travel distance in half uh, from the accessible spaces up on the parking deck. Uh, so that you know, reminded me why we actually looked at this precise location to get the closest point to the uh, health center entrance. So uh, a couple other comments that were made included uh, why not align the lower section of this ramp with the existing walkway that runs along the east side of the uh, bang center. Uh, it was a great comment, never thought of why we didn't do it, uh, but now we've made that adjustment and uh, lined up uh, center line with the five foot walkway that runs to the e along the east side of the building. Uh, made those adjustments and by doing so ended up eliminating the 
the the larger landing at the midway point and just make it a you know a ramp uh, with a traditional or standard five and a half foot landing, turn 90 degrees uh, down to the uh, walkway. Uh, another comment that was received, or a couple of comments on this, was uh, about saving that uh, London plane tree. Uh, so I took a look at that, and, and we certainly can protect that uh, from the construction activity and make sure that that tree uh, doesn't get removed. Uh, so I went ahead and uh, 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 made a note to save that tree. You'll see that's the tree that's uh, halfway between the bottom of the stairs and the and the, the end of the ramp that's not shaded out in the center of the work area uh, right there. Thanks, Pam. Uh, so uh, there will likely need to be a little trimming uh, to that tree. One of the, the branches uh, will be hanging over the ramp that, that could get trimmed back and one over the other walkway uh, in the opposite direction. And we'll, we'll talk with Alan Snow about... Uh, uh, doing that properly, but uh, the tree will remain. Uh, so uh, the other trees uh, indicated there, uh, four of those are white pines, uh, linden, and something else right near the stairway. Uh, those, those will be removed as part of this project. Um, I took out the landscaping. We had a couple of areas of shrubs. There was a, there was a comment a couple comments about the landscaping were that um, make sure we use a, a shade tree and make sure we use uh, evergreen plantings. And, uh, you know, what we decided to do is let's, we we're just going to remove that from the contractors uh, portion of the project and work with uh, those that are interested. Uh, the shade tree committee certainly had had some thoughts and opinions. Alan Snow's office will have some opinions and and probably some volunteers from the bank center. Uh, and, and we can all work on, uh, you know, purchasing uh, plantings and getting those installed uh, either during or towards the end of this project. So we just went ahead for simplicity, remove those. Uh, the last comment that we had was about the lighting. Uh, although I'm still waiting for the exact specs from uh, the town's uh, uh, inventory of this light pole that we use, um, we we do believe, especially with the removal of the the white pines and the tree near nearest the existing stairway, that uh, the location that we're showing will cast enough light, uh, or can be made to cast enough light uh, to to properly uh, uh, provide safe travel through this ramp area. But uh, we're still looking at that to finalize any detail. If there's any needed uh, additional lighting, we'll certainly uh, consider that when when that time comes. But we think this is going to work fine. Uh, so that's all I had for an update. This really doesn't require any action of the board. Uh, really appreciate uh, getting the approval and, and, and being able to move ahead. I'm happy to take comments, questions. Uh, if there isn't any um, you know, great opposition to what we're doing, we're going to go ahead and bid it uh, uh, later this week or early next week. Uh, and hope we get some interest in it. Uh, and we're also uh, more than happy to come back at a, a regularly scheduled meeting time if we wanted to talk about this in any more detail or any particular aspect of it. Thanks. Uh, Chris, yeah, um, with regard to the, this not, this is not a, a public hearing. Uh, it's just more recommendation. Well, you already approved this, um, I think, um, by a, it was either five to one or six to one, I can't remember. But anyway, so you've approved it. And this is just an update to show you what changes um, we've made prior to putting it out to bid. But I also wanted to mention that we're currently going to um, rebuild the, the stair. Last time we came to you, I think we were talking about um, just resurfacing the stair. And we're not moving it or anything like that. So you don't have to approve that. But I just wanted to point out that we're actually rebuilding the stair and uh, the wall, the concrete wall that is on the southeast side of the stair. That's all. OK, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Rob. I just had um, two quick comments. One would be on the, 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 the path uh, or the ramp, sorry, that's kind of oriented north-south. Um, any reason why we, why we wouldn't just put that landing in the midpoint looks like from your contours that it's a pretty even grade and just thinking that, you know, that that would be easier for someone to travel. Um, I, I don't use a wheelchair, so I couldn't say, but it, it would seem like rather than if you can have a 225 instead of a 30 and a 20, that that might be useful. So just a thought. 
And then I was also wasn't sure, um, again, not not being a wheelchair traveler, but by eliminating that ramp, um, is that it looks like a five foot path? Is that that's navigable for like two people going through in wheelchairs, or um, not? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I understand your question, and no, it wouldn't be. So if, if okay. a wheelchair is heading up the ramp and one heading down the ramp, it would not be wide enough to pass by each other. At any point or just at that corner? Uh, I think it'd be really tight at the corner as well. At, at five, So five and a half feet is the width of the ramp that you, is really what you need to get the four feet clear between the handrails once they're cored into the concrete walk and mounted, you know, a few inches in from the edge. Uh, that's really about the minimum width that, you know, you can build this. So I don't think that would be enough to pass by. Uh, okay. Somebody walking by could, 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 you know, navigate that, but not two wheelchairs. Okay. All right. Um, any idea how long it would take for a wheelchair to travel at, just out of curiosity? It, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, just like thinking if you're at the bottom and you're waiting for somebody to come up or down, like if you have to wait for a minute. I I, I get it. It's like tough to make this fit, but um, that would be my uh, just additional comment um, as you take this out to bid. But thanks for bringing this back. I appreciate the uh, the extra thought and consideration of our comments. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I and I want to ask. I uh, thank Doug. Um, who has the stand up um, for going back out and, and assisting Rob is my understanding. So uh, Doug. Yeah, I was just gonna say thanks to Rob for, you know, hearing us and uh, putting some effort into uh, accommodating some of our comments. I hope, I hope we didn't jeopardize any state funding by uh, delaying this project. Um, but I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Whoops. Great. All right. I apologize uh, to everyone for not knowing that we already had the hearing on this and we approved it. But um, So this is more just informational. Um, and appreciate, Rob, your presentation. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, any other old business, Chris? Unanticipated? I don't think so. Okay. So let's uh, move on to new business. Uh, we have the proposed zoning article 16, temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units. Uh, so we're just going to have a discussion. I'm, I'm not really super comfortable with having the discussion right now because we have a hearing coming up, but um, it's on our agenda. Um, uh, we will not have public comment. And again, I, I really don't have anything to say. Um, and so I'll open up to the board. May I give an introductory statement? Yes. Okay. So um, I, I just want, uh, well, I'm Chris Brestra, planning director. Um, and I wanted to introduce this article to the board um, just so that they would know what's coming up. Uh, its title is Article 16 Temporary Moratorium for 180 Days on Building Permits for Construction of Residential Buildings with Three or More Dwelling Units. The public hearing for this zoning amendment will be held on May 19th at 8 o'clock, um, so mark that down. It will be a joint public hearing of the Planning Board and the CRC. The planning board and the CRC each need to make a recommendation to town council on whether to adopt this moratorium or not. Tonight's meeting is not a public hearing, but rather a chance for the planning board members to become familiar with the proposed zoning amendment and to ask questions and possibly discuss the topic prior to the public hearing. We did put it on the agenda. The building commissioner, Rob Moore, is also here with me to answer questions that the planning board may have about this proposed zoning amendment. The moratorium proposes to ban for a period of six months the issuance of building permits for residential buildings with three or more dwelling units in the BG, general business, BL, limited business, and RG, general residence, zoning district. 
This would include subdividable and converted dwellings, apartment buildings, townhouses, and mixed use buildings. The idea behind the moratorium is that the petitioners want to provide time for the town to address certain zoning issues prior to granting permission to construct new residential buildings in the zoning districts that I just listed. The zoning issues that they want to have addressed during this period are design standards related to streetscape, sidewalk width, and green space for new multi-unit developments, building heights and setbacks, inclusionary zoning, the definition of mixed use buildings, changes to the municipal parking overlay district, and the climate action resiliency criteria for new construction that is expected to be recommended by the upcoming climate action adaptation and resilience, resiliency plan. The proposed zoning amendment includes an extension for 90 days of the ban if the town is not able to implement the zoning amendments listed. The moratorium does not affect the planning board or the ZBA's ability to review and approve proposed projects. It merely prevents the building commissioner from issuing building permits for those proposed projects. So I just wanted to give you that background information. Uh, this was Good. put on the agenda at the request of one of the planning board members. Andrew? Yeah, uh, I, I actually just had a question in terms of how this is written and like what, what we think kind of the definition of done is on this thing. Because um, it, it, set, it reads to me like the moratorium, moratorium's in place until we change the zoning. Um, and what if, what if like we don't, we decide to not change the zoning? I think it's um, in place for a specific period of time. But I mean, it's so it's, it's, we, if we sit idle, it's 270 days, 180 plus the 90. If it's adopted. Yeah. Wait, if it's adopted, if Article 16 is, okay. If Article 16 is adopted. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I'm just also curious whether, um, just in, in conversations, you know, other board members have had with residents, is, is the driving concern the design slash architecture? Is it the, the fact that, that the residential units in the new construction are, are so high priced? Is it um, the lack of like vibrant ground floor retail or you know, something different? I'm, I'm curious what folks have heard in, in just some of their conversations. I'm, to me, a lot of the a lot of the comments I hear just seem like people um, don't like the design, right? And I get that, but it's also that's like a matter of opinion and taste. And so I'm I'm just again you know, love to hear anything folks may have heard or just their own thoughts on that. Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to caution people against um, talking about this with members of the okay. public. Um, the planning board will be holding a public hearing and you know when you go into a public hearing you're supposed to be um, I won't say neutral you can have your own opinions but um, you're supposed to hear what is presented at the public hearing and mm -hmm. obviously you're reading newspapers and things like that but having conversations with people outside of a public hearing about it that's not sharing that information with um, the other planning board members so not everybody's hearing the same thing and you know if you do hear something on the street it's probably a good idea to bring it to the public hearing but I'm just discouraging people from having what do they call it ex parte conversations about thanks it. for clarifying I think one of the things that's helpful Andrew is um the last few days I've been going back through um all of Chris's emails over the last month or so um and you can aggregate um, a, a sense of what the concerns are and they're very broad reaching and I, interestingly not many of them actually apply to the things we're trying to accomplish here so that's something we want to pay attention to right that um, 
the this uh, these updates referring to streetscape, building heights, inclusionary zoning, and so on, are there things that we're focused on? But we have to pay attention to the fact that a lot of the commentary is necessarily targeted towards those things. So I think it's sort of figuring out sort of the making sure we're incorporating and listening to this really broad range of feedback that again is in those comments and some of them are for some of them are against but they have different um things that they're trying to address and but i do think that we have to be careful because this sort of the bylaw that that we're proposing or the um the um amendment doesn't necessarily address a lot of those things. So I think it's just trying to find the right balance there. Um, so it's just something, but again, I'm the one that raised this because I felt like we might have a lot of questions that Chris could answer. One of them is about the origins of this and sort of how it got from someone's idea to the table in front of us that we're gonna talk about it now and then gonna have a joint meeting, kind of what was that process? And I've read anecdotal things, but I wanna make sure that I understand, you know, when it was proposed by who, who brought it to who, and then how did, how did it get to us so that we have a little bit of an understanding of um, the chain of events that brought this to us. I can Chris? give you some background on that. Um, so um, originally there were three uh, town council members who um, thought this was a good idea to present this um, zoning amendment and they were um, getting ready to present it uh, to town council. They had it all written up and they actually did submit it. And they submitted it pretty much in the form that you see it currently, um, obviously on a different date with different signatures. But um, when town council members submit a petition or a not, it's not a petition, when they submit a um, suggestion, recommendation, whatever you want to call it, like this, they have to get the whole town council behind them to, um, or n I shouldn't say the whole town council. You, they have to get um, a significant number of town council members to put this forward as a town council proposal. And um, in conversation, they decided that they probably weren't going to get the full town council um, behind them to actually put this forward. So what they did was they decided on another tactic, which was to um, seek uh, petitioners to sign a petition. And they did get and then a lot of petitioners to sign this petition. Um, they needed 10 signatures. And that's um, by the charter. The charter says that um, a number of citizens can submit a zoning petition um, if they get 10 signatures. And so the 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 people who initiated this went out and got, I think, over, last number I heard was 283, but I'm sure it's over that now. Um, so they got a significant number of signatures on this. And so it was able to be um, brought to town council and then town council didn't have a choice, but they had to automatically refer it to the planning board and the CRC for a public hearing. So that's what they did. And I can't remember exactly when that occurred, but it was probably in early April. I think it might have been April 5th, um, which would make sense given that the petition was dated March 19th, but I'm not sure of that date. So anyway, that's how it got to you. And um, so we talked with, I talked with Mandy Johanneke, she's the chair of the CRC and Jack talked with her too. And um, we determined that May 19th was a suitable date for this public hearing. And that's how it got here. But um, as I said, at least one member of the planning board indicated that he or she thought it would be a good idea to bring this to you and have a, an initial discussion about it just so you understood what it was about. I have one more quick question, Chris. Thank you, that was very helpful actually um, to sort of track that backwards. Um, thinking forwards, um, there are, there are, there's commentary around the relationship of this to the archipelago project um, that the DRB is reviewing. Is this something that would be, would this decision 
have the capacity to block that project or was that project submitted before this or tell me what the relationship of this to that particular project might be? Um, I would like to stay away from how this moratorium would affect any particular project. I think that's kind of treading on thin ice, um, okay. especially because the planning board will be holding a public hearing about yeah. that project and then the public hearing is gonna open on May 5th. Um, so I think we should consider those two things separately. But what I can say is this moratorium is about building permits. It's not about whether the planning board can grant approval of a project. So the planning board can go ahead and hold its public hearing and come to its conclusions. Um, but the building permit for a project cannot be issued until this, if the moratorium is adopted, the building permit couldn't be issued. Now, what I would say is that um, what I've observed is that it often takes developers a while after they receive their land use permit, they have to work their way through their construction documents. And they are usually not ready to submit construction documents until several months after they receive their land use permit. Um, so Got it. my my gut feeling is that it's probably this moratorium is probably not going to be, you know, a significant deterrent for buildings that are being proposed. What what would affect buildings that are being proposed is um, the zoning amendments that the planning board and the CRC are considering. So if a zoning amendment is passed and adopted by town council and goes into effect. Um, you know, during the re review process, there is a relationship between uh, the timing of a zoning amendment and the approval of, um, of a particular project. And I can go into that if you're interested in that, but. No, that's very helpful, very helpful. Thank you. So, uh, Jana? So, just, just at the outset, I just wanna um, encourage people to talk about this. Um, on the planning board and not feel like you can't because it's very often that the planning board discusses zoning amendments many times before it comes to a formal state hearing. Like we would be normally talking about it with the zoning subcommittee. We, the zoning subcommittee would bring stuff to the planning board. Planning board would suggest revisions. And so that process, it's not, you know, it's not like we're not in a being, we're not at a trial or in trying to sequester ourselves. So I, I would encourage people to talk about it now um, because I think there's not going to be a big chance to talk in depth um, when we have like 12 people with the CRC. And so that's my first thing is let's just talk about it. Let's talk about the gist of this and openly. Um, I think that the, I mean, my understanding just by reading this and, you know, following the process is, is the sense that the town is looking to hire a consultant for $100,000 to work on downtown issues and mixed use buildings and design guidelines that we should have passed, you know, 11, you know, 10 years ago. Um, as the master plan said, don't increase density unless you have strict design controls, you know, or do it simultaneously. And so I think there's a feeling of, you know, buildings are going to get built without, you know, design controls that people support. And so I think that, um, you know, it seems, that I think there's like a timing question. So, you know, all these permits might come through and then we hire a consultant and then we say, let's do this setback and have this good sidewalk. Let's have some green space. You know, all the issues that are raised, like let's do inclusionary zoning, um, you know, all the things that we're talking about as zoning changes and that will happen, you know, in too late. And so why not take a pause um, especially since we have a few buildings downtown that have, you know, not a lot of public support. Like if you can, you know, what you're probably hearing from people and also um, the two downtown meetings that the planning board held, I think in 2016, but I might be wrong. Um, they did kind of a survey and those, you know, those buildings were kind of panned for how they looked. And so I think people are really afraid to keep that things are going to keep going forward and we're not going to address problems that have been, you know, like basically, um, we all know there's problems with downtown and the planning. We, we haven't been doing downtown planning and it's just going to keep rolling along and not get addressed. And I think this is a lot, you know, hundreds of people saying, please wait, please put the zoning things in that we support 
Um, and it's, you know, and then go forward. And so I think, you know, I mean, you know, Dorothy Pam is here and she's one of the originators. So it'd be great to have her talk maybe. Um, I would like to hear from the public, but I think that, um, you know, people want to talk about party, parking. I know Darcy Dumont's committee that she's working on is going to come in with different climate recommendations and was just looking for a pause for that. And so I do think there's a lot of meat to this. And there's like, I think the problem is that we just haven't addressed the problems for a really long time. And then I think my personal experience is we have gotten sort of from the town council zoning priorities have just sort of taken over us, taken us by storm as a planning board in the planning department. And a lot of people are seeing that process doesn't really address downtown problems either. And so I think this is trying to put the focus on what is a really important issue to Amherst residents. But I really would like people to talk about it. I mean, I'd like to hear what people think about it. I, I don't have a super formed opinion about it. And I sort of did maybe a version of what Tom Long did where I started to just read through the letters and write down like, what, what are people's concerns? And there is a lot of repetition and I, I didn't get a chance to do like a big synthesis, but then I started to do the mediators think about like, what do people want to see? Like everybody can say what they don't like, but can you turn that into what people want to see? And that got me sort of looking forward um, you know, people want to see adequate parking, right? <laughs> you know, they want to see design standards. They want to see buildings that have setbacks or well-designed buildings. You know, a lot of people wanted to see more retail down, downtown and more, you know, small, small stores. Um, you know, people were looking for mixed income housing. You know, some people very specifically wanted non-student housing. Other people wanted housing with year-round residents. A lot of people wanted mixed income housing and affordable housing. So I could kind of go through this whole thing, but I think I think as a board, it's it's actually a great opportunity to listen to the public. And, you know, as the Spiegelman said, let's just take a pause and focus on some problems and analyze them. And we're, the pause that we're, what we're focusing on has nothing to really to do with downtown until the planning department brought the IZ and the uh, mixed use to us. I mean, I feel like I'm getting sprayed with a fire hose and then we're gonna be permitting a building or buildings that all these issues are gonna become incredibly live for. So that, that's a big piece of information, but I feel like I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it to help think through it. Thanks, Janet, uh, Doug. Yeah, um, I, I actually would like to take Chris up on her offer to talk a little more about uh, how zoning changes that are approved, depending on when they happen in the process, what their impact is on, on a, a project. Um, and I'm thinking specifically that, you know, there's two of these six items on six of these, two of these bullet points where, you know, I, th I think we've heard that CRC is about ready to take zoning changes, amendments uh, on those topics back to town council. And I'm referring to inclusionary zoning and the definition of mixed use buildings. And so let's just use those as the hypothetical. Um, you know, if, if, if we have the hearing and get through the permitting with a project and, and then town council adopts a couple of zoning changes between the time we approve the, make, approve the site plan review um, and before the building permit is issued, uh, do those zoning changes uh, affect that project? Thank you. So I can answer that partially. And we also have Rob Mora here, if I can uh, take an opportunity to speak, Jack. Yes, uh, Yohan is back. So um, just want to note of that. Okay. Um, so yes. Okay, so, so um, essentially, a zoning amendment affects a project if it's um, the advertisement 
for the public hearing, the first advertisement for the public hearing appears before the project gets either a special permit or a building permit. I think that's right, but Rob might be able to clarify that. But anyway, um, so when a zoning amendment is being proposed, um, you know that the planning board holds a public hearing and the planning board has to advertise that public hearing twice in two successive weeks prior to the public hearing. And so the first advertisement um, is the key. And so a project is moving along, a zoning amendment is proposed, the advertisement is in the paper, and usually we have the first advertisement on a Tuesday, which is about 15 days before the public hearing for the project. So that project is needs to comply with that zoning amendment um, if it is finally adopted. If it's not adopted, they don't have to comply with it. But if it is adopted, it has to comply with it. Um, so a project really needs to um, get through its site, its uh, land use permit process. Um, and if it is receiving a special permit, it needs to receive the special permit. Um, and I think the special permit has to go through its 20-day uh, appeal period. But again, Rob might clarify that. Or if it's just a site plan review project, it has to receive a building permit. So um, it's a kind of complicated relationship. And um, it's not at all clear that the projects that are currently out there are going to be finished with their public hearing process, receive a special permit or receive a building permit during the time that um, zoning amendments are being approved or considered and approved. So um, can we call on Rob to um, have a few words about that and, and make sure that I said that correctly? Okay, Rob? Yeah, Chris, I think you said that correctly. Um, I think, you know, what I get asked all the time is uh, if a site plan review is issued, does that protect, uh, you know, the applicant from the zoning change and the site plan review alone does not. Uh, so it would have to move ahead and actually receive a building permit. Uh, if the special permit is granted before that first advertisement that Chris just described, if the special permit is granted, the applicant has 12 months to receive their building permit and start construction at, and, and not be subject to that change. If they don't do that within the 12 months, then they would be subject to the, uh, the new bylaw if it ended up being adopted. Uh, but otherwise I think Chris had it exactly right. Great, uh, Tom? Yeah, sure. I just want to follow up quickly on this. I guess some of the questions that uh, Doug is raising, but also um, what Janet's speaking of and kind of what I referenced earlier. I think the, the Janet, you're right. I think listening and paying attention to, to what people are saying is important. And, and I want to be cognizant of the fact that there are lots of opinions out there and that our job is somewhat to, to listen and pay attention. I think what what I'm what I was cautioning about earlier is that many of those things are not actually going to be remedied by this. So even though we might wait six months and we might delay and we might have a consultant and we might do all these things, there's very little that people are asking for that are going to just automatically be remedied by waiting six months, right? So I think I just want to caution people from thinking the moratorium is going to fix the problem. There's still another process in this, you know, that might not protect them from a building that looks like one of those buildings. And that might not be in our design standards. That might not help people. It might not solve the problems that people are asking for. So I, I think I'm just asking us more I'm asking us to think about separating some of those things from what we're actually trying to accomplish here. The moratorium is not gonna necessarily solve their problems. It might just defer those problems six months down the road. So I, I just wanted to, to raise that, that's all. Good, thank you. Um, Janet? So one of the things I've been mulling over is 
the building permit language because this is um, this is a petition by you know residents you know 284 of them and I don't know if they know that there's a difference between a, a special permit a site plan review permit and a building permit so um, and so I kind of thought you know they're citizens broad construction they probably just think a building permit, like a site plan review permit that we issue or a special permit or the building permit, that's all the same thing. It's permitting a building. And I can see Rob's like, no, this is really different. And I, I think it is, if you're on the inside and if you're on the outside, maybe it's not, it isn't, it's incomprehensible. So it just, they might just think, oh, we, we were covering those permits. But I just wanted to raise that issue and, and, and push it aside. Um, so I guess Tom's point is, if people really wanted to do inclusionary zoning or change the definition of mixed use buildings or they don't like the building heights and setbacks, you know, even if the consultant is recommending that, um, it's not gonna capture these buildings, um, you know, cause they still can get permitted in some way um, or they, at least they can't get their building permit, I guess for, you know, you know, nine months and things like that. And so, I don't know, I just, I just think that maybe that's okay for them. You know, maybe this is a way of them trying to push some changes that they'd like to see um, that actually we'd like to see, you know, like the inclusionary zoning. And we'd like to work on the definition of mixed use buildings. And so we, the planning board could actually very quickly decide to hold the, the public hearing on the mixed use building um, you know, amendment, zoning amendment that the planning department had presented to us, even knowing that it may not be the one that, you know, goes to the town council or it isn't changed, but we might want to do a notice of hearing very quickly, a statutory hearing, just to, you know, put in a placeholder. I don't know if we, we're in the mood to do that, but we don't have to wait for a long process, you know, to happen and things like that. Or maybe this is just the way the public's saying, this is what we really care about, and we just want to we want to do some planning downtown and see some changes and not see all these changes. So um, I was kind of taken aback by how many letters or emails that we got in such detail. And it just was it just I didn't know most of the people. I knew some of the people that were writing, but there's a lot of strong feeling of people, and they had very specific and sort of well thought out ideas. You know, some people just wanted more information, you know, more more information on housing needs and things like that. And you know, it just seems like a lot of passion for people, you know, in the in the center of Amherst, and people were really worried about major changes to, to Amherst. So um, I just, you know, I just, there's so much stuff in there, and I just think, you know, we need to do the best by our town and, and also listen to people. I would also like, if we have time, I know it's, you know, people don't want to stay forever, but maybe some people in the public would like to talk, or we could, or we'd like to listen to them. Uh, Chris, did you have a comment? Yes. Um, so if the planning board decided to hold a public hearing on its own, it wouldn't have any meaning because what has to happen is that given our current form of government and the way zoning amendments have to go through the process, um, someone has to propose a zoning amendment to the town council and then the town council has to refer it back to the planning board for a public hearing. So the planning board could hold a public hearing, but it wouldn't be on that path to eventually um, having an amendment come to be, and therefore it wouldn't suffice to um, put a stake in the ground as of, you know, this is the first public hearing, this is the first publication of the date of the public hearing. It wouldn't be oh, effective. Sorry. I meant, I meant the planning board could send the, the zoning amendment to town council and then have it come back and hold the hearing. So that's we could, right. the planning board right. could. I'm sorry, it was unclear because we, we have that, we can do that too. Okay. Yes. Thank you for correcting that because I, I thought. Uh, Maria, please. Um, I think more of a. You're on mute. Holy cow. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, this is more a procedural question for Chris. Um, 
tonight we weren't supposed to be deliberating on opinions and what our thoughts were because this is not a public hearing. I, I think what Tom was asking was, you know, more administrative and history and questions about like how this moves forward. But I didn't think we we're supposed to be uh, discussing it and deliberating and giving our perspectives tonight. Um, Am I wrong in that, Chris? Uh, it's just because Janet's asking us to talk about it and I thought we weren't supposed to do that. I think you can give your perspective just like you would on a mixed use building zoning amendment that we brought to you, but I am not um, inclined to listen or take public comment at this time. This wasn't advertised as a public hearing. The planning board is just becoming familiar with what's being proposed. And I just feel like we shouldn't take public comment tonight, but I think the oh. board as a body can discuss this and share your opinions. Oh, and, okay. And it's a public meeting that you're holding. And it's just like if you were talking about inclusionary zoning or apartments okay. or mixed use buildings or whatever. In, okay, you know, I then I would like to share my opinion. I thought we were supposed <laughs> to hold off on like, our ideas because we needed to talk as a group publicly. But if it's just for us to discuss um, informally, I guess, um, I really appreciated the bids email, um, Cinda Jones's email, uh, the most recent one, I forget his name, but it was just from people who sort of saw the bigger picture and saw it from the perspective of how we make uh, Amherst a, a sort of more thriving community of not just individuals, but businesses. and it's all got to be balanced. You, you can't just have people saying, I don't want this in my backyard, being the loudest and sort of not thinking about sort of, uh, you know, that Amherst is a town for everybody. So I really appreciated the emails that were coming from, you know, the working class in a way, um, the people who are just, you know, keeping things running. Um, and so I, I think that that perspective often is a minority as far as the voices we hear. And so, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate those emails and I wish we had received more of them, but I think we're, well, they're also busy working <laughs> that they don't have the time to, you know, come to these uh, meetings and to keep up uh, with everything on, in the Daily Hampshire Gazette or on the Amherst website. So um, that was my opinion. I just sort of appreciated people who are sort of trying to keep businesses running and the community going to have time, take time to make their voices heard. Thanks, Maria. Uh, you know, it was, we opened up uh, the meeting saying that we weren't going to take public comment on this because we have a hearing. Um, I'm not, this is just informational so we can prep for it, uh, so we can learn about, you know, the topic, which again, I think we have by the questions presented by Tom and, and Doug and, and Janet and et cetera. But um, I, I'm not comfortable with really, I don't want to present my, my thoughts on the matter because we have a hearing coming up and I just, uh, it's, it's, you know, with the CRC and, and as, I, as I look at the agenda, I was just, you know, I had an exchange with Chris wondering why are we doing this when we have a hearing, but, um, if anybody else has um, wants to, you know, get more information about, you know, the specifics on this and the inner workings and, you know, the timing of the nature of, of this with regard to, you know, projects coming online, let's talk about that. Um, but uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I was going to just mention that it, I find the timing actually kind of hard to understand uh, because if people were so upset by uh, Kendrick Park and One East Pleasant Street, uh, why didn't this uh, petition show up right after One East Pleasant Street? Um, I know that there was another project proposed back in the summer of 2018 for the parcel that has the spoke on it. And I think it also included Bertucci's. Um, that project didn't go forward, I think in part because the uh, Historic Commission imposed an 18 month 
uh, delay on the demolition of Bertucci's. But I guess it just doesn't feel like this is the first time uh, that we've had a big project proposed downtown since the first two buildings were built. So, you know, why now as opposed to two or three years ago? Thank you, Doug. Um, Jan or Chris? I just wanted to say um, that I think I know why now. And it's because we're talking about um, higher, we're, we're asking for money, um, capital funds to hire a consultant to help us with some of these issues. The consultant isn't gonna be able to solve all of these problems for us. Um, we're asking for $100,000. And in this world today, $100,000 doesn't go all that far. So we may be able to solve some of these issues. I hope that we can solve others of them by ourselves. And I think everybody's energy would be best um, focused on uh, working on zoning amendments. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay, Janet. I have a question for Christine, which I, Jack, you, you emailed me. Um, so I sent out, I didn't know that there was a previous building moratorium um, passed. And Christine, do you know what happened afterwards? Like, what was the, the effect of that? Like, were changes made during that interim period? Or does, does anyone have the history? That's 1986? I think so. Yeah, yeah. it was way, way back in my youth, really. I think that had to do with a sewer moratorium. Um, there wasn't enough sewer capacity to uh, accommodate what was being proposed. Um, Otto Paparazzo, uh, a developer from California, came to town and proposed um, 2,000 units of dwelling units in the what is now um, Amherst Woods, Amherst Fields area. And um, people didn't feel that they could, uh, that the infrastructure in town could accommodate that. And so um, they put the moratorium on, I think it was on for two years. And Otto Paparazzo, um, I think he went bankrupt and went back to California. So part of the project got built, but it, it never really came to pass. And, and that's what that was about. So that was a specific um, issue that the town needed to deal with having to do with infrastructure. And I believe they did eventually deal with that. And so the moratorium went away and we've been developing property since. Um, so that's my understanding of what it, what that moratorium was about. I can research that a little more if you're interested. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, anybody else want to ask a question of Chris or Rob? And it's a um, May. What what's the date again? <laughs> May 21st? May 19th. May 19th, okay. And said so eight o'clock, um, there was one town council member, CRC member who uh, couldn't meet before then. So we're meeting at eight o'clock. We may have, I don't think we're gonna try to have anything else before that, but I guess it's possible. Yeah, um, joint, joint meeting with the CRC. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and so that legal ad will be coming out soon, but um, I'm not exactly sure when. And then is there going to be a limit on the time for public comment? Or are you going to take everybody with, you know, two minute or three minute comments? Is that if that's the only thing on the agenda, I think you can take everybody who wants to speak with some limitation on how long they can speak. We could become a town council meeting. How much is 283 times two minutes is how much? No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 560. Can minutes. we start at five? <laughs> I mean, we are getting a lot of written comments, both you know, you know, uh, against and and um, you know, for. But um, okay, I, I think it'll be nice to have CRC. I, I I think this is really not you know, particularly within our wheelhouse uh, as a planning board to 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 look at something like this. It seems like more of a a town council thing. Um, 
but we are going to have our hearing on it. Um, you will need to make a recommendation to the town council about this because yeah. it's a warning amendment. And it's good to find out about it a little ahead of time so you can think about it. And then when you read something in the newspaper or you see a comment that comes via email, um, you'll understand what's being talked about and you know you can form your own opinions. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion on this topic? Good, all right. So um, let's move on to topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting for new business. No topics. Great, uh, Form A subdivision applications. We have one, but we're not presenting it to you tonight. Pam has been um, dealing with it and we'll bring it to you at your next meeting. Very good. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications? Uh, nothing new that I'm aware of. All right. I'm coming uh, SVP, SBR, UB applications. Um, I think you know about them. Oh, well, actually, you don't. Um, there is, you know about the uh, 11 East Pleasant project, but there's a new project at the Emily Dickinson Museum. Um, they're proposing to install some mechanical equipment behind the barn. And so they're gonna be coming to you with um, information about that. It involves erecting walls to screen off the mechanical equipment so that it's, you know, doesn't impinge upon the landscape. And there may be a few other things associated with that. So we just received that today. And um, there may be a couple of other things out there in the wings that we haven't received yet. Okay. And uh, I don't really want to go through all the committees because we just, you know, went through this last week, uh, unless anybody wants to raise their hand with new information. Okay. Uh, report of the chair. Uh, I have nothing, but I look forward with the warmer weather that we can get together in some fashion. <laughs> uh, and and uh, as the, the planning board used to do back, before, you know, pre Mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, report of staff. I would like to announce that we are not having a planning board meeting next week. <laughs> and I think that's reason for celebration. All right. Okay. Yay. I will have to delete that on my calendar. <laughs> um, and that's the 28th. Okay. Very good. Okay. So um, I think we adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.